Hi, thanks for coming to our uh, Ask EFF, Meet EFF panel. I'm Jennifer Granick. I'm the Civil Liberties Director at EFF. And what we're going to do tonight, it's nice, we have kind of a manageable crowd here. So what we're going to do tonight um, is we're going to, I'm going to introduce everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, cases we've been working on over the past year, just to give you guys some highlights and uh, at a kind of high level. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up for questions from you guys and try to answer your questions. So there's a microphone that's over there and you'll be able to line up there and ask your question and we'll do our best to answer it um, up until about 6.50 at which point I think we're all just going to call it quits. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. I'm going to talk with my colleague here, Matt Zimmerman, more in depth about hardware hacking and in a, at a very geeky level about the DMCA exemptions we recently won for unlocking and jailbreaking and, uh, and non-commercial <laughs> videos. Um, We've been waiting for that rulemaking since November and honestly I was wondering what was taking them so long and I'm so excited that they issued it right before DEF CON so it's great. Um, for, so for people who are really interested in that, we're going to have a whole talk about that sort of stuff tomorrow uh, at 10, yeah. I think. And then um, later on tonight, for people who are interested in movies or interested in surveillance or interested in surveillance in movies, um, my colleague Kevin Bankston there towards the end is going to be doing Big Brother on the big screen with Nikki Ozer from the ACLU. And that is at 8 o'clock looking at um, surveillance in the movies. So that should be really fun also. Okay. Um, you guys are here, I imagine, because you know what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is, but for those of you who don't, we are a civil liberties organization um, dedicated to protecting privacy and free speech online. We are a membership-funded organization, which means that um, what keeps me off the streets and fed are people like you who give us money, so we appreciate everybody who is a member. Now at DEF CON is a great time to become a member because we have a super cool shirt that has a black light kind of secret message in it and you get access to our newsletter and all of that stuff. Um, so if you are not now a member then uh, perhaps you might consider doing it here at the con. Um, we focus on a whole variety of issues having to do with privacy, free speech and consumer rights in the digital realm. And I'm going to just go through a few of these things today to kind of give people who are not that familiar with our work an idea and also to evoke questions in your mind and then we'll go forward and, and uh, kind of turn the floor over some to you guys and I will moderate. The first thing I want to talk about, of course, is something that seems like a lot of people here have already heard about, which are the um, DMCA rulemaking. And this is a triennial thing where uh, Congress, having vaguely recognized that there's something deeply broken about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, allows for uh, rulemaking for exemptions to the anti-circumvention provisions of that law that allow people to do certain kinds of hacking. And uh, in 2006, back when I was at Stanford, I got an exemption for phone unlocking to take your handset and put it onto a different network. And this year we kind of tried to press forward on some of the ideas that uh, had engaged the Copyright Office in that rulemaking and try to go a little farther. So we asked for three exemptions and we got three exemptions. We asked for the unlocking exemption to be renewed and then we asked for an exemption for um, jailbreaking. In other words, to take your mobile handset and can reconfigure it so that it can accept, can accept applications of your choosing. Um, so what does this really mean? It's about mobile handsets and and uh, circumvention for using uh, interoperability of apps. And we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then finally, the third one for a non-commercial video. You know, if anybody knows anything about the DMCA, it's really mind-blowing the Copyright Office decided to do anything nice for people who like to make fair uses and spe free speech uses of video. And so we're really proud of that one. Um, in the privacy realm, we work both on issues having to do with the government and issues having to do with privacy versus um, companies. Now, on the government side, um, my colleague Kevin Bankston at the end works very hard on sort of issues having to do with statutory privacy rights under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and how to make that law better. Um, and his project of digital due process puts us together with other civil liberties groups and companies trying to update and improve and strengthen the statutory rights that we have for um, communications privacy online. Um, we do work uh, with 
various companies, uh, Facebook, Twitter, other companies trying to figure out um, you know, how to help people be more safe about their information with those companies. And to that end, we have um, worked on a social network bill of rights that addresses both privacy and free speech issues. Um, and everybody at, uh, at, uh, everybody at EFF works on that sort of stuff. But I think Kurt Opsahl, who's my colleague right here, um, will be the person who will answer your questions if you have uh, any issues about that sort of thing. Uh, those of you who know me know that I do a lot of computer crime work, that uh, I love and hate the computer crime statutes at the same time. And we've been doing a lot of work looking at how computer crime statutes have been used to kind of lock people in to various services. Um, so this year we have two cases actually involving the scope of the computer crime statutes and how they regulate what users do. One is our Facebook versus Power case involving Facebook's lawsuit against a data aggregator um, in which one of the claims is that um, violating terms of service in order to do data aggregation breaks California's computer crime law. Um, and another case, which is a criminal prosecution in New Jersey, um, United States versus Lowson, or I call it the Wise Guys case, where a group of people who um, called themselves the Wise Guys were purchasing tickets through automated fashion off of the Ticketmaster website and then reselling those tickets on the secondary market. Um, so my colleague, Marsha Hoffman, who's here sitting next to Kevin, if you have questions about those sorts of things, she'll, she'll probably be the one to answer those. Um, we do a ton of work, as you guys all know, on intellectual property rights and free speech and innovation. One of the big things that we've been working on um, recently is this problem with uh, these kind of copyright troll uh, mass lawsuits against people where uh, the uh, rights holder of some or another sort, U.S. Copyright Group or some other, um, files a lawsuit against 5,000 unnamed does and then goes to um, subpoena from a provider like Comcast or Time Warner the identities of people with particular IP addresses who they think have been using BitTorrent or other peer-to-peer -peer file sharing type uh, software to download stuff. Yeah, well, are you booing um, the are you booing the mass litigation or are you booing the the downloading? Yeah, the, I mean to, to have a lawsuit against I wasn't sure, but it, it was the timing was unclear to me. You know, we have a lawsuit against 5,000 people as seeking their you know their identifying information. It's like how can you do that fairly so that people are notified so that they're not wrapped up in a lawsuit that's improper? Um, you know, with a bunch of other people who they have absolutely nothing to do with. And Eva Galperin, who is our intake coordinator, who's sitting there on the end, helps us manage all of that stuff with all five or six or 10,000 of people out there who call us saying, I think that my IP address is being um, subpoenaed and I, I need to know what to do and I need your help. So, yeah. <laughs> if, if any of you ever call EFF and you're, and you're looking for help, then you know about how, uh, how great Eva is at trying to find people help and how grateful we are at e for Eva to you know, help us figure out how to, you know, how, to, how to give people assistance without talking to 5,000 people on the phone in a single day. Um, along the same lines of intellectual property and how it impacts privacy and speech, we have um, cases where we deal with um, where we deal with uh, claims of intellectual property infringement that uh, impact on parody and other sorts of jokes like that. So I don't know how many people here know what, who the Yes Men are. So some, some people know. We, we have a case with a group that was doing a um, fake press conference parody of the United States Chamber of Commerce. And um, the United States Chamber of Commerce didn't think it was funny. So they sued. Uh, this group, the Yes Men, saying that it was a violation of their, it infringed their trademark rights. And uh, so you couldn't do this spoof parody thing uh, of the Chamber of Commerce, so they're too, too precious. Um, and sort of along similar lines, we have uh, another case just involving anonymity and, uh, and the right to free speech where a gentleman claiming that he is the world's number one hacker got some comments from people on uh, the internet suggesting that perhaps not everyone agreed with that assessment of his skills. And there was something of a flame war over it, so he filed a lawsuit against um, a number of anonymous people and um, has not yet, but seems to be poised to sort of try to serve subpoenas to find out who it might be who disagreed with that contention. Uh, and so this is another example of you know, how litigation is used to try to intimidate people through finding out who they are and then you know put subjecting them to lawsuits and that sort of thing and it's very hard for people without you know any kind of organized resistance to to 
protect yourself under these circumstances? How do you fight back? And that, that's one of the things that we think of as being an important thing that we can do is not only to provide these sort of direct services people, to also to find a way to kind of disincentivize um, this misuse or abuse of the uh, of the legal system. And you know, to that end, not only in trying to uh, get the court to do the right thing and the mass uh, BitTorrent litigation stuff, like actually make them file separate lawsuits because these are separate incidents and that sort of thing. Um, we have pushed for courts to award attorney's fees to the winning defendants if it turns out that the case was illegitimate. And that is some one way that um, people can kind of push back, even though you can't afford lawyers or that sort of thing. It gives a real disincentive to plaintiffs who might otherwise you know, who might otherwise abuse the, the uh, legal process. So those are just some of the things that we've been working on this year. Um, we have a bunch of other stuff we've worked on too. So uh, if you have questions, or let me just go through and actually make sure I've said everybody's name. And then we're going to ask you to just line up at that um, <coughs> microphone over there if you have questions. And we'll go through and just talk about the stuff that EFF does. So here I have Kurt Opsahl, right here sitting next to me. And then Matt hey. Zimmerman and Marsha Hoffman and Kevin Bankston and Eva Galperin. So, you guys, no questions? Well, we're all gonna go home early today. There we go. Is that on? Okay, say your question loud and I'll, uh, I'll rephrase it for the audience. In, in your work, do you find that one political party does a better job of representing our interests than the other or do we need to look at each political candidate individually? Do, you, do I, any of you guys want to handle this question about the political parties? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Democrats talk a good game on privacy issues, uh, particularly candidate Senator Obama made a lot of promises about reforming the Patriot Act, reigning in surveillance authority, greater transparency and accountability. Now, I'm, I'm speaking on privacy issues. I, I, I'll leave it to others to talk about copyright or, or anything else. Um, but it seems that those in power have pretty much the same opinions as the last people in power. And typically, regardless of who's been elected, the DOJ is the DOJ is the DOJ. And they will want the same things now that they wanted under President Bush and that they will want under the next uh, president. And so, for example, just this week, there was news that broke that the Obama administration is pushing Congress to expand uh, one of the uh, most dangerous and worrisome uh, surveillance powers that the Patriot Act expanded. These are national security letters, which are letters that are issued by individual FBI agents to get records about your communications, who you're communicating with, and how and when and how much. Um, without any court oversight and with a gag order that disallows the provider from ever telling anyone that they were snooping in your records. Um, they want to expand this power to go beyond just basic subscriber information like your name and address and billing information and such and beyond phone records which they've been allowed to get to extend to any undefined electronic communication transactional records. Um, this is the sort of thing we uh, expected in the prior administration. It's the sort of thing we had hoped we would not see under the Obama administration, and yet there it is. And so I would say that, disappointingly, we found less of a difference than we'd like between the parties when it comes to surveillance issues. Yeah. You want to say anything about that with regards to copyright? Or? I think we... Okay. Next question. Right. On the uh, recent iPhone ruling, what exactly does it say that you can and can't do with, regarding jailbreaking? Okay, great. So your question just gives me the occasion to um, say the disclaimer that I just wanted to say before, which is that um, we can't give you legal advice here in this forum, and you don't get attorney-client privilege with us in this forum. In other words, what you ask us, like if you're like, well, what if somebody had a bunch of cocaine in their car, and it was parked outside the rib, and don't do that, okay? So don't, don't reveal stuff like that. And, and what we'll tell you is general legal information, but you can't consider it to be legal advice. That having been said, I can answer your question. Um, the, the, the jailbreaking exemption says that you may circumvent technological protection measures in your mobile handset for the purpose of putting um, 
uh, applications on the phone to make the phone interoperate with different applications. So, um, you know, the, the ruling is not specifically about the iPhone, it's about any handset, but, you know, under the current, you know, what's out there on the market, I think that the most popular um, phone to jailbreak is the iPhone, and the apps restrictions are really about the, the iPhone app store and so that's going to be the platform that people are going to be interested in, in jailbreaking. So one question people ask me is like, well what about the iPad? It's built basically the same way. Does that thing work? Does the exemption work for that? And the answer to that's going to have, going to unfortunately be no. Um, what the, copy, the way the rulemaking works, it's very arcane and weird, but the way the rulemaking works is you have to identify a class of works that you think that people should be able to have access to and demonstrate that during the three years prior to the rulemaking, people's ability to make legitimate non-infringing uses of that class of works was adversely impacted by the DMCA. So the iPad didn't, pre, didn't exist back when we filed for the DMCA exemptions, um, and the class of works that we identified was the, the um, firmware on the mobile handset. So just to, that's basically what it allows you to do. Okay, if you have, you know, there, there may be more specific things you're kind of thinking of, but that's basically what allows you to do mobile handset. So I actually have a why. question related to that. Sure. I don't, I don't where I didn't work on this project, and I'm confused. Which of the exemptions is limited to used cell phones? And a little softball here. What exactly does that have to do with protecting copyright? <laughs> thank, thank you, Kevin, for that insightful <laughs> question. So we asked for three exemptions. One was for un the jailbreaking, which we just discussed, and the other was for phone unlocking. And that one was to, was, be, would, was phrased to allow people to access the class of works, um, which is which you have to access in order to make the phone go onto a different network. So not for apps to be installed and run on the phone, but for the phone. To to be reconfigured and run on a different network. So the jailbroken iPhone on, on T-Mobile, or if I wanted to do this for my Verizon phone so it could run on any other CDMA work, network, that kind of thing. So there are two separate ones, and one is about the class of works for going on a different network, and one is about the works for going on to the different, for using different apps. So in the course of the rulemaking, uh, it was opposed by Virgin Mobile and also by CTIA. And one of the things that they were most concerned about is um, that some uh, people go out and buy handsets, prepaid sort of handsets in, from the you know, big box stores in bulk um, and unlock them and resell them on the secondary market. And they do that because these companies sell the handset at a loss. They sell it at less than it's worth in order to inspire people to buy it so that then they purchase, you know, services from the virgins or track phones of the world for, you know, many more months. So it's a razor, razor blade model. They kind of sell the razor cheap so you keep buying the razor blades and they don't get the benefit of that subsidy if people unlock the phones and then ship them overseas and sell them. And it turns out the subsidy is big enough that they actually can kind of pay everybody all all the way down the line, a dollar or so on the handset, and people overseas or wherever still are getting kind of a discount on it. So it's just sort of the way they structured the business model. And what I said, you know, they were like, how can you allow people to do this to us? And, you know, what we argued was there's all sorts of people with used handsets who want to resell them for legitimate reasons or they need to be recycled or repurposed. They're perfectly fine phones. You know, I'm sorry that's your business model, but, and you may have other recourses, but you don't have the, the recourse of the DMCA. And so as a nod, really to these concerns I think um, the copyright office recommended and the librarian adopted a rule that said that the unlocking exemption only applied to used phones. Now what's a used phone? I think I know what's not used, what's new, and I'm pretty sure I know what's used, but there's going to be a gray area. I, I don't know what exactly that means. Um, maybe it will be litigated, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the second question, which I think is the more important one, is what is the DMCA copyright rationale for limiting my exemption to used phones? And I think the answer to that is none. It's clearly just a, you know, craven throwing of a bone to um, some industry groups that objected to the rulemaking and there's no, you know, copyright reason or infringement reason for them to have done that. So I feel like they took my 2006 exemption, and they put its hand on the table and they chopped a couple of pinkies off. So I'm kind of upset about it. But <laughs> on the other hand, it's good for the rest of us and for our clients in the rulemaking who are phone recyclers. So I, I can't complain too much, but I definitely don't like it. 
Uh, my question references the, uh, the Boucher case uh, with regard to uh, encrypted hard drives. Uh, at least as far as the last I heard in regards to the case, uh, as the prosecutors weren't able to compel uh, Mr. Boucher to produce the password, uh, he was compelled to produce the unencrypted contents of the hard drive. Or at least that's as far as I had heard uh, a ruling where rather than hand over the password so that investigators could unencrypt the hard drive's contents, he was ordered, I suppose, by the, by the judge or instructed to produce the contents, the unencrypted contents of the drive. So rather than give up the information, he, or rather than give up his password, he had to give up the information they wanted. I just want to know if that was something that you guys were aware of or something you might consider as being something that should be uh, altered or that ideally wouldn't stand as a precedent? Marcia, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Um, I can take it, but do you, you may want to supplement. I, I don't have like a, I don't have a really good answer for, for it. Um, you know, Mr. Boucher was not ultimately required to turn over his password. Uh, the government, uh, I think, initially appealed it, but then dropped the appeal. And so, you know, that's a, a situation that just stands. Um, you know, as for the fact that he was compelled to give give over his encrypted hard drive, um, unencrypted. I unencrypted. Pardon? You think unencrypted? Unencrypted, encrypted hard drive or unencrypted hard drive? Well, my understanding from what I'd read, and I don't know if it was what they were intending to ask for since they weren't allowed to, to compel him to give up the password, was that they were going to compel him to give up the contents of the hard drive that he had encrypted. So in other words, they wanted him to unencrypt the hard drive so that he wouldn't have to give up the password, but the investigators would still have access to the data on the drive right. in an unencrypted format. Actually, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Are you, Jennifer? Or? A little bit, yeah. yeah. I, I don't remember exactly in the facts of this particular case, but, but it's, it, it makes a lot of sense under the law, right? So um, there's two issues here. One is the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, and the other is the Fourth Amendment right um, against unreasonable searches and seizures. And the Fifth Amendment problem with the, with the password is this compelled disclosure of the password and what that tells you about the case, which is that this person has control over this data. And so the courts, because of our Fifth Amendment, are grappling with how to deal with that problem. In the Boucher case, they said, well, we're not going to force them to turn it over because we think it implicates the Fifth Amendment. So then the question is, okay, a workaround, what can we do to get access to this data without having this Fifth Amendment problem? Now, government has all sorts of ability to get access to information, and the Fourth Amendment is, is one of them, and there's also other kinds of things like, uh, you know, discovery and subpoenas and those sorts of things. So what it seems here is that is to say, okay, instead of forcing you to turn over this piece of information, we're going to force you to turn over the actual underlying data. We could do this by getting a search warrant to search your house, right? We could get a search warrant and go in your house and seize the unencrypted data if we wanted to. Or if you're a defendant in the case, we can serve discovery subpoenas on you and we can make you as the defendant turn over stuff that you have in your custody and control, just like you would have to do in any other kind of civil case. So does that violate the Fourth Amendment? You know, if, if you comply with, if the, if the process complies with the Fourth Amendment, you're cool. You got a search warrant or there's a subpoena to you for you to disclose it and there's no privilege or anything there, there's not a lot that the defendant really necessarily can do well, at that point because neither of those things apply. Uh, one, one nice feature of, of getting a subpoena for the information is that you can raise objections, you can move to quash the subpoena, you can raise, say, oh, well, some of this information is attorney-client privilege or some of this is uh, you know, doctor-patient privilege and such. So you can assert objections to uh, discovery in a manner that you, you can't uh, really uh, in a warrant contest because they're just seizing it and they're just doing it. Um, and so this uh, creates the possibility for a court to rule, okay, these particular items uh, are off limits because they're attorney-client privilege or such. So in that sense, it gives you a, a little bit more of an opportunity to assert your rights. A trade secret or whatever. So it's, it is a more privacy-friendly way to go about it, exactly because you have a notice and opportunity to be heard prior to the deprivation of your, of your privacy right. So, so I guess that kind of answers your question about whether we're planning to do anything about it. It, it fits well within the traditional Fourth Amendment way that you can get information from a criminal defendant. So thanks for your question. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, what would you consider the ratio of, cl of cases you're able to accept to cases you're not able to accept due to resources? Eva? I probably see a dozen cases a day. And of those dozen cases, I probably send eight or nine of them uh, to other organizations or they're not real issues or they're people who think that they have microchips implanted in their job by the government. Um, in which case we can't help them. <laughs> we have surgeons that we send them to for that. We have not yet started the cooperating surgeons mailing list. I, uh, I talk to the attorneys here and I, I usually um, dig up maybe two or three cases a quarter uh, that we take on ourselves uh, that, that wind up in litigation and then probably about six or seven cases a week that go out to our list of cooperating attorneys for a referral and two or three they get private referrals. So a very, very small number of cases are actually taken on by the EFF, but a reasonably large number of people are helped that don't have chips embedded in their jaws. One of the things I think people don't necessarily realize about the EFF is we really have like nine or ten lawyers. I think people think of us as being a lot, lot bigger than we really are, but we're really, you know, we're, we're not, in terms of our, our uh, U.S. lawyers, not our international team, we're not that big. So. Most of us are here. <laughs> <laughs> I, have no, I don't know what they're doing back at home. <laughs> Actually, all of last week, uh, we were almost entirely out of lawyers, and uh, I was forced to tell some people who had reasonably interesting cases that, uh, no, we can't comment, we can't help you. All of our attorneys are out of the office. What happened? <laughs> Legal team retreat. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Thank my you. My name's Randolph Morris. I'm one of the defendants in the High Tech Hustler case. The number one hacker. I just wanted to, this is more of a testimonial than a question. I just wanted to thank all of you for the article you did and Eva especially for communicating. It took me uh, to need you guys in order to become a member and I hope that it doesn't take more from uh, people to have to be affected in order to become members as well. Thank you very thank much. You. That's kind of you. So much for his privacy, though, huh? <laughs> uh, so I went to your, your earlier panel about uh, laptops uh, searching, and I was uh, wondering, there, there were several sort of protections that you guys enumerated, and I was wondering, do they apply also to non-US citizens, especially around border crossing and so on? Do you want to answer that? Or? I, I, won't, I won't speak to the border issue, which is more Marsha's domain, but in terms of the, uh, the Fourth Amendment applies if you are in the United States. You have Fourth Amendment rights whether or not you are a citizen. Uh, similarly, when it comes to statutory protections for the data you store in the cloud, I always have to put scare quotes around that, but uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, that does also does not turn on your citizenry. Uh, and applies to any person who is storing data with a communication service or remote computing service provider in the United States. And as for the border issue, um, you know, the, the sad fact is that you really don't have Fourth Amendment protections at the border, and it doesn't matter whether you are a U.S. citizen or not. You know, the, the, uh, and when I say you don't have Fourth Amendment protections, what I mean is that the government generally does not need uh, any suspicion whatsoever to search your stuff at the border. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier today, the only situation in which they, they, they need any shred of suspicion is if uh, they want to search your, the interior of your body uh, for contraband because they think you're, you're smuggling it over the border. So, um, so again, you know, unfortunately, even for U.S. citizens, there's, there's not much protection there. Well, one uh, uh, difference, however, for, for non-U.S. citizens at the border is that uh, if you, uh, say, dis decline to allow your, your laptop search or won't turn over your password or such, um, for, they, they can turn you away. Uh, uh, Customs and Border uh, Patrol has a, a tremendous amount of latitude in deciding whether to allow somebody uh, uh, into the country. Um, and so that gives them an additional tool to try and put the pressure on somebody at the border uh, to, to cooperate with them or uh, on pain of being forced to turn around and go back to where they came from.
Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Next, uh, I also have a follow-on to the laptop conversation, and the, somebody made mention of forensic software not honoring uh, user boundaries. That was and I'm me. wondering if there's any um, litigation action or other motions in place to try and convince or compel uh, <laughs> forensic software vendors and or manufacturers and or investigators to put, be put in a position where they must honor user boundaries. Yeah, I mean, to me it seems shocking. To, for those who weren't in the talk, I was mentioning how in this one case about uh, you know, somebody who gave consent for a search they didn't actually have consent to do, and the FBI was technologically able to do it because NCASE doesn't respect um, accounts on the computer. Not, you know, encryption, but, but just accounts. And I was saying how I, that made me mad. And, and the question is, you know, can you, is, is there any pressure on vendors to do it differently? And I think the pressure on vendors to do it differently would be if the law required you to do it differently. So the biggest case out there that's pushing to require law enforcement to do computer searches differently is United States versus comprehensive drug testing, which is a case in the Ninth Circuit. And that case arises out of these very egregious facts um, surrounding the uh, Balco steroids investigation. The investigators had reason to, um, had some reason to, to suspect and investigate some number of ball players, um, you know, you guys, maybe, does anybody here watch sports? You know, Barry Bonds and that whole thing. <laughs> and uh, they had some reason to investigate some of those people, but what they did was they used a multitude of, of efforts to using search warrants and subpoenas to get whole directories, spreadsheets of thousands of athletes and all of their drug tests from a company that did the blood work on these things. And uh, the courts were understandably annoyed that the government had turned an investigation of 10 or 14 people into a fishing expedition that got private data about thousands of, of individuals. And so what the Ninth Circuit did as the case kind of wound up its way up, the Ninth Circuit tried to issue some, some rules to prevent this kind of abuse from happening again. And one of the rules was that you can only search for things you have probable cause to search for. Duh, you know, and it's like, okay, that seems like what the Fourth Amendment's about. But they said, you know, you have to have a search protocol that's designed to get you the things for which you have probable cause and not designed to get you the other stuff. And that you should have the forensics done by either an internal team or by an external forensic, you know, third party, and that where they're going to look for the right stuff, and then all the other stuff that they might happen to turn up, they're going to just throw that away and not give that over to the investigative team. Some some rules are to try to like deal with the fact that computer data is always going to be intermingled with private stuff. Um, more than you know in any other kinds of searches or seizures that we've had before and how do we keep the private stuff still private while allowing law enforcement access to the stuff that they're entitled to have access to when they have when they have good cause for it and comprehensive drug testing is uh, anathema to the government they hate it other jurisdictions have considered whether or not to adopt it and have generally not so far although you know it's kind of wending its way through the courts and I think what we're going to see though is as those rules sort of get pushed forward and as we we try to make case law that says that you have to do these things, the vendors are going to not want to sell software that violates the Fourth Amendment because the investigators don't want to get their cases kicked out for suppression reasons, and that's going to inspire there to be better, you know, better search tools and more, uh, and, and better forensic tools that adhere more closely to what I think our reasonable expectation of privacy is with regards to these vast repositories of intermingled data. Yes. So I know that the uh, EFF is about affecting change through legal action and not really getting into the lobbying side of, of legislation. Um, and, and I certainly support you financially, and I hope that most of the audience here will support you financially. Thank you. Um, what I'm asking is how else can we affect change in policy, in government, in legislation? Do you have any kind of recommendations for other actions we can take other than online petitions or writing your senator or congressman, which really doesn't seem to get any well, any kind of results. Is there any advice you can give to the audience to how we can affect policy and change in the government? Well, I'd first like to take issue with, uh, I mean, thank you for the question, but it actually does make a difference when your senators and congresspeople hear from you. Um, we ultimately failed to stop Congress from passing an immunity for the th phone companies that assist in the NSA's warrantless uh, surveillance program, for example, but we held it off for nearly two years, and that is almost solely due to the fact that ordinary Americans 
were pissed off about it and thought that it was wrong uh, and wanted their Congress people and their senators to maintain the rule of law. Um, so I, I don't ever want to minimize the importance of uh, your leaders hearing what you, the people, actually think, because it, it makes a huge difference. Um, in terms of what else you can do, <laughs> well, I mean, along these lines, uh, we, we have something called the Action Center, uh, action.eff.org. And this is where we ask our, our members to take action on various issues. And yes, sometimes it is uh, saying, please write to your senator or, or uh, congress critter uh, and, and express uh, some views or, or, or some such. But that is our, um, our best way of trying to organize uh, the power of uh, our, our membership, where you know, uh, you know thousands and thousands of people are, are part of the Action Center, and by making concerted action, that can help some. Um, you know, otherwise, keep keeping aware of the issues and uh, following it so that, that you can um, tell your friends about these issues and spread the word, you know, blog about uh, issues and, and use uh, online tools to keep people informed about it and that can help uh, more people take action and hopefully we can get good change as a result. I also wanted to add, uh, some of you all already heard this from Chris Connolly of the ACLU at his Facebook talk, but there are certainly opportunities for you guys to build things that help educate and agitate. You know, he was talking about people coding Facebook applications or bookmarklets or other things that educated people about how Facebook was using their data or helped them evaluate whether their privacy settings were good or helped them scrape out their private data so they could move it somewhere else that better respected privacy. So certainly you guys should be thinking about what are things we can build to affect change. I'm just a lawyer, I can't build things. I can go and talk, but you guys can build stuff. Um, and that is a great power. Thanks for the question. Other questions or that's it? Do you guys have anything that we didn't talk about today that you'd like to talk about a little bit? Um, I figured since this is an audience that definitely cares about it considering how well our NSA t-shirts sell here. Yeah. Um, I did want to give you guys an update on the NSA lawsuits. Um, it's been a rough year. Uh, in terms of uh, holding the NSA and AT&T accountable. As I mentioned earlier, there was a law passed back in the summer of 2008, uh, the FISA Amendments Act, and that included uh, purported immunity for companies that had helped with this uh, warrantless wiretapping program, um, the full scope of which the government still has not admitted. And it basically gave the Attorney General the power to file a secret certification with the court in those cases saying either, I think the program was legal, or even if it wasn't, the president authorized it, or it didn't happen. And the court has to dismiss under this statute. Uh, we've argued, and we did argue at the district court when the attorney general filed this certification that this was unconstitutional uh, for a ver variety of reasons, but mostly because Congress was unconstitutionally delegating to the attorney general the power to decide what the law is in these cases. Um, but our case against AT&T and all the other carrier cases were dismissed. We are continuing to fight that. We are on appeal at the Ninth Circuit right now, just finished the briefing, uh, and we're awaiting a scheduling of oral argument in those cases. Um, as for our second NSA case brought directly against the government, that's Jewel v. NSA, um, our judge zigged when we thought he was going to zag. Uh, we had done really well in the AT&T case when it came to the government's argument that, sorry, but judges can't litigate whether this was uh, legal because everything about it is a state secret and any discussion of it would harm national security. Uh, we had won on that issue and the court had allowed us pr to proceed in the AT&T case uh, before this immunity passed. The government made the same arguments in the government case and uh, we were hoping for a similar opinion. Instead, our judge uh, dismissed our case on a rationale that the government never argued, that never came up in oral argument or in the briefing that came after argument. Um, and it's a pretty, uh, with all due respect to the court, pretty crazy idea, which is uh, you may have heard of something called taxpayer suits, where people try to challenge government conduct uh, based on their standing as taxpayers. So if you thought the Iraq war was illegal, and you brought a case in court saying, well, my money is being spent on that war and therefore I have standing to challenge it in court, the courts disfavor those. And uh, those are called in the law generalized grievances. You don't have any special interest 
in stopping the war uh, as a taxpayer differentiated from anyone else. And so the law is, as far as generalized grievances, though, those are better left to the political process and aren't really the domain of the courts. Our judge in the NSA case said, well, you know, you have alleged that this wiretapping program essentially reaches everyone who uses the domestic networks. Um, and so I think that's a generalized grievance, and I'm dismissing your case. And what that means is, so long as the government wiretaps everybody, <laughs> the courts can never judge whether that's legal or not. Um, we think this is very clearly wrongly decided. Every single one of our plaintiffs has a concrete and individual injury, which is their own communications and their own records were ensnared by this dragnet. And so we are uh, appealing that decision as well. Um, there was a little rejiggering of the schedule such that our opening brief to the Ninth Circuit is going to be filed next week. Um, so we are continuing our fight uh, in terms of the NSA warrantless wire, wiretapping program, and both of the cases are before the Ninth Circuit right now. So for those who are wondering. Question? Uh, I'd like um, some commentary on the uh, EFF initiative in Australia um, looking at the uh, blocking list, the blacklist that the uh, Australian government's considering and uh, if you've got awareness of the uh, EFF, uh, they're the major spokesman that is arguing against it and pointing out the technical and ethical issues with that particular initiative and also uh, any other large international initiatives that the EFF has been involved with around the world. Um, so unfortunately, our, uh, we have uh, three people on our international team, but none of whom are actually at, at uh, DEF CON this year. Um, so we are active on international uh, issues in our, this three-person team. Uh, you know, we have the, the rest of EFF is, is mostly focused on the United States, and we have a small team there, but they are working uh, all the time, flying around uh, the world to try and promote uh, uh, digital freedom. Um, I, I believe that I, I have heard, you know, through through talking to them that uh, about this block list, but I don't have enough uh, information on it to give a, a really intelligible answer. Uh, but, I mean, one of the things that that we do try and do uh, I internationally is. Um, work to promote good policies and talk to uh, uh, the, the appropriate policy making groups like the, uh, uh, the EU and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe um, and the Internet uh, Governance Forum um, and the, this group is, is very active. They're also very active on intellectual property issues through uh, UN chartered organizations like WIPO. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have specific information about that particular block list. Are you talking about the ACTA three strikes thing? No. no. Okay. No, well, I can briefly describe it. The uh, current government in Australia is considering a secret blacklist of URLs. The major rationale is uh, child pornography, and obviously, uh, and the problem is beta tests of it had legitimate websites. And its technical actual ability to achieve its stated goal has been seriously questioned, and it raises ethical issues. Yeah. Colin Jacobs, the EFF spokesman, is the major person fighting yeah, the that, government in, this, in Australia over this issue. Yeah. I mean, that raises a point worth clarifying, that there are a variety of Electronic Frontiers organizations, including Electronic Frontiers Australia, that are not officially affiliated with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They are our friends and our fellow travelers, but they are not actually officially connected to or our organization. So Electronic Frontiers Sweden or... Uh, uh, there's Electronic Frontiers Italy, Electronic Frontiers Finland, Electronic Frontiers Australia. There's a number of these organizations. Um, just to, to, to address some of the larger points, this actually is... Uh, this has come up uh, uh, in the United States, the notion of having uh, a block list. Uh, sometimes uh, it has been done in the form of URLs. Uh, which uh, have not been very efficient in making sure the URLs are all correctly put on there. Uh, there was another um, uh, a proposal that we dealt with a number of years ago, but it was interesting because it was trying to uh, say, well, the URLs keep on changing, so um, we're, we're going to do it based on IP numbers. Uh, but they, they didn't uh, <coughs> seem to realize that 
a number of these IP numbers actually resolve to a wide variety of domains. Um, and so if any one of the domains that was resolving there uh, was on the blacklist, then everything else uh, that, that was associated with that IP was also being taken down. Um, and, and here in the States, that was a big uh, uh, First Amendment problem because if you are going to try and have a law that, that takes down speech uh, that is very disfavored here and needs to be narrowly tailored not to take any more speech uh, than is necessary. Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, make a, a little bit of a, a plug for um, our, our technologists. In addition to lawyers at EFF, we have a technologist team, uh, and they've been doing a lot of uh, good work. Um, and, and actually, our, our technologist who's here, Peter Eckersley, he's uh, uh, doing a Q&A related to his own talk uh, right now. Otherwise, he would be on stage with us. Um, but one of the one of the cool things that uh, we've come up with lately, I wanted to uh, draw up your attention to, is a project called HTTPS Everywhere, uh, which is a, a plugin for uh, Firefox that uh, uh, makes it so that a set of sites which uh, do uh, support HTTPS. Um, if you use the plugin, it will make sure that anytime you go to those sites, it uh, goes to the HTTPS version of those sites, and the sites include things like the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Facebook, um, a lot of sort of high traffic uh, Google search, uh, Wikipedia. Um, so it's a nice uh, a tool to ensure that in case you forget to uh, be using end-to-end -end encryption uh, and don't put a, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't manually put an S in there, or some of these things uh, have a different URL like Google search encrypted uh, dot google dot com for searching there. Um, so this is a nice tool to uh, help out a little bit uh, with having your end-to-end -end encryptions while you surf around the web and uh, hopefully make it a little bit more difficult for someone to warrantlessly eavesdrop on your communications. Yeah. More than nice, it's freaking awesome and you should download it. <laughs> Oh, uh, another technology project that we uh, have been working on is a project called Panopticlick. Um, and Panopticlick was uh, designed to look at the, uh, uh, what you can tell about a browser um, sort of other than cookies. Are the differentiations between uh, various browsers unique enough that you can uniquely identify a particular browser based on other factors. And so uh, as it turned out, the answer is you, you really can do a pretty good job of uniquely identifying a browser by looking at things like the number of fonts installed, which fonts are installed, uh, what uh, extensions they have, what versions of the, the software, uh, how, how big the screen size is. And once you add enough of these different uh, 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 things together, uh, you come up with a pretty unique uh, signature. And if you want to check it out for yourself, you can go to uh, uh, Panopticlick, a, a website we put together. Um, uh, you can find it on, on our website or, or by searching for it directly and check how unique your browser is um, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, see some, some of the things that, that uh, um, well, it's actually a very difficult problem uh, because if you, if you try and make your browser uh, less unique, that may be helpful and you, you, can, you can set some settings so that you are uh, having the same as a group of other people, but that will probably then identify you at least as part of a group that is trying to get around this, uh, this system. <laughs> but nevertheless, I encourage you to, to, to check it out. It's a, a very interesting project to show where cookies are not the end of, uh, uh, of identifying people online. Well, you know, as you guys can see from this panel, you know, we're sort of a small shop. We have three international lawyers. We have nine or ten, I can't remember exactly, um, uh, United States lawyers. We have a lot of people who help us with, um, with membership and development and intake and referrals and all of that stuff. But all in all, we're like 25 or 30 people really operating out of a kind of sketchy neighborhood in San Francisco, California. Um, but we it's really... Sketchy. It's sketchy. It's it actually sketchy. was the, one of the top five dirtiest blocks last year. Um, so, you know, we, but we, yeah. This <laughs> we, year, number one. We, we really care. I mean, we try to um, affect 
change and work on these issues that we care about at the international level. We try to put forth um, cool technology that's fun to use that helps people secure their privacy. We try to come to conferences like this and hear from you guys what you're interested in and tell you what we're up to in addition to our litigation and the few things that we do lobbying on and our activism and all of our all of that stuff. This is Peter actually right here the now. Thank you for coming awesome Peter. Plug -in. <laughs> We were just talking about HTTPS everywhere. Um, but we're, we're wrapping up now, unless you have something you'd like to say to the audience. No, I guess if we're doing a breakout session, I'm just here to answer questions later. OK. Um, so uh, you know, we, we appreciate all of your support. And um, you know, I, as you guys know, for those of you who have seen me here before, I love coming to DEF CON and talking to people. Um, you know, we try to, to, to you know, get everybody we can some kind of help one way or the other, get them information one way or the other. So um, thanks for coming and listening to us. And thanks for all your support and interest in the EFF. And uh, we look forward to many more years of long and fruitful um, collaboration with this community. So thanks, guys. Thank you all. We'll see you at uh, 8 o'clock.